Ayo, welcome into the CHGO White Sox postgame show presented by PointsBet. Use promo code CHGO when you sign up to get two risk-free bets up to $2,000. Welcome into a remote version of the CHGO White Sox postgame show. I'm Sean Anderson, the host of the CHGO White Sox podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. And alongside me, as always, is Herb Lawrence. Hello. Follow him on Twitter at Ecknerwall23. He's a CHGO White Sox community leader and Vinny Duber. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Duber. He is the uh, pageant winner, the uh, former pageant winner uh, with that wave uh, and <laughs> CHGO White Sox beat writer. It was very, very elegant. Uh, what wasn't elegant, guys? Uh, the White Sox took a one game trip out to Kansas City and they lost. Uh, it was a six to four loss. And not only did they lose, they might have lost one of their best and brightest and youngest starting pitchers. Let's get into it as her, Vinny. Which one are you getting arrested? Which one is that going Someone from? is outside on Clybourne Avenue. So oh, uh, if that's where you're listening from, you know, heads up. Watch out on your citizen app or whatever you may have. Uh, anyways, let's go into what happened in today's game. Uh, top of the first, the White Sox got hit by a pitch to start off, a base runner to start, and then Luis Robert flied out, and then Eloy Jimenez grounded into a double play that will sound familiar a little bit later bottom of the first Michael Kopech's pitching but he won't be for long Michael Kopech walks MJ Melendez he then hits Bobby Witt Jr. and then Salvador Perez singled into right field Melendez scored Bobby Witt Jr. goes to third and then Vinny Pascatino uh, walked and Perez goes to second and that was it Michael Kopech throws 19 pitches today and does not record an out gives up one hit allows four earned runs two walks no K's, and he hit uh, you know, one batter as well. So let's just jump in right there. Michael Kopech leaving the game after 19 pitches. What was the immediate reaction? We'll start with her. Immediate reaction was, I don't know what Michael Kopech had said to the training staff and Tony La Russa before he started actually pitching in the game because we saw in the uh, package that NBC Sports Chicago threw out there that Michael Kopech in one of his warm-up pitches kind of tweaked something. It looked like he tweaked something, and so that's why Sebi went out and checked on him, and they had these training staff out there. And so whatever he said to him, it convinced Tony and the training staff and the pitches that he subsequently threw that he was fine. But once the actual game started, his first pitch, I believe, was an 88-mile-per-hour four-seam fastball. Ring the bell already. That's an alarm. That's way off of his, his miles uh, per hour usually. Somebody get up, A. Hey, Oh, he's not right. We got to get him out of there. Something. I don't understand why they allowed him to face four more or three more batters after that. It was ridiculous. Obviously, everybody at home knew he was hurt. And obviously, he's left the game early this year with a knee problem where that sack burst, apparently. So there is a precedent for <laughs> this player specifically. And you saw exactly what was going on. I think most of the people who are watching and observing that knew that Michael Kopech wasn't at his best, and there was a chance right there you could just take him out and not had as much badness that happened in that first inning. I'd say this. I'd say that Michael Kopech probably isn't a doctor. Uh, I'm not trying to say that it's on him, obviously, but I think there are things maybe that you feel in your body sometimes that, you know, you think you might be able to, to work through. Uh, you know, it, it, maybe he thought it felt like a cramp. You know, maybe he thought it felt like something uh, that he's experienced before that he has been able to pitch through. Uh, it was quite obvious after, like you said, a couple of batters there that this was not the guy that we're used to seeing, that he something was not right. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying one pitch should have been the end, end of it, but maybe two batters should have been because, you know, he almost hit, or he did hit uh, the second batter he faced. And it was clear that he was just all over the place, really, from the get go. So um, it it is Horribly unfortunate. I mean, my goodness, this is the second time this season we've seen Michael Kopech have to leave a start after just a couple of pitches, really. Um, Herb, you mentioned what ended up happening there. That was the the knee. That was on the other leg um, when he came out of that game uh, against Texas back in June. Uh, now we're talking about the other leg. Uh, doesn't really seem like we know exactly what the injury is at the moment. Uh, knee soreness was what was described by the team, uh, you know, shortly after Michael left the game. Uh, and now we're seeing tweets from Kansas City saying Tony La Russa uh, saying that it's a hamstring in, in injury, which perhaps further evaluation, which was included in that tweet that the White Sox sent out, revealed it to be something different. Uh, or perhaps there's just a, uh, a, a, a communication breakdown somewhere there uh, between, you know, Sox brass. But um 
the the regardless of what it is at the moment, uh, it's a not it's not at all a good sign. And uh, for Michael Kopech to have to leave a game that early, I mean, guys, we talk about it all the time. You can look at the opponent and say and say, oh, this is a big game. Maybe you know, oh, this is a different kind of thing. For this team right now, every single game is a big game. And uh, you know, to lose the starting pitcher and have to rely on the bullpen, which for the most part did a pretty good job today. Um, you know, uh, to have to rely on that and really burn so many pitchers before you go into Baltimore, uh, it's not at all good. And it, it, it helped, it kept them from winning today. Perhaps there were a lot of other reasons that kept them from winning today too, but it's hmm. one of them certainly. Uh, and it could keep them from winning, not just this week, uh, depending on what happens with the bullpen going forward, but into the future, depending on what might happens with Michael Kopech going forward. So all around bad for uh, that situation uh, that took place in the first inning today. Yeah, and there's a lot more with Michael Kopech that we will get into later on with the show. If it is going to be a longer injury, maybe we'll get more in info uh, from Kansas City, whether it is a hamstring issue, whether it's a left knee issue, whether it's a right knee issue. Uh, it, it seems to be lower half. Uh, we can at least, uh, you know, like a, a hockey injury, we can just say lower half soreness and uh, hopefully we'll get more info. We did expect the worst for Yasmani Grandal. And now, you know, people are saying, oh, he might miss the you know entire season. Only 10 to 14 days for Yasmani Grandal's injury. So maybe we'll get good news uh, for Nike Michael Kopech. But if not, uh, we'll talk about the ramifications a little later on in the show. But like Vinny said, uh, for the most part, <laughs> the bullpen was good. Jimmy Lambert ended up relieving Michael Kopech. Vince Velasquez came in after that. Jake Diekman came in. Reynaldo Lopez threw six pitches. Kendall Graveman threw an inning. Joe Kelly had a rough outing. Mm -hmm. And then Jose Ruiz uh, came in. The White Sox were able to escape the fourth inning and that fourth inning uh, allowing Kansas city to score four runs, but the white Sox did not give up. And thankfully it was in the bottom of the first and not the bottom of the eighth where they scored eight runs. Uh, the top of the second was pretty quiet. Bottom of the second was pretty quiet. Top of the third, pretty quiet. Bottom of the third, pretty quiet. But top of the fourth is where the white Sox get cooking. Uh, Jimenez singled into right field with one out. Then Jose Abreu singled into right field, moving Abreu to or Jimenez to third base. Then Andrew Vaughn singled to left field, scoring Jimenez Abreu to second. If you hear the word single over and over again that is not a mistake then Moncada grounded into a fielder's choice it was a close play could have been a double play Moncada busted it out of the box and then seemingly started to run just a little bit slower but he still beat it out to keep the inning alive my guy Elvis Andrus then singled into center scoring Jose Abreu scoring Yohan Moncada making it a three to four game then Harrison singled the White Sox still putting pressure Zavala then walked and with the bases loaded AJ Pollock in a four to three game popped out to first base and ended the threat. So another game where the White Sox get the bases loaded and just aren't able to have that huge inning. Daniel Lynch was the opponent today for the White Sox. We've seen the White Sox struggle against Daniel Lynch. It seemed like a better game, a better game plan against uh, uh, Daniel Lynch today, Herb. They were able to get on base, a lot of walks from the White Sox. But again, that word single over and over and over again, the White Sox end up hitting seven straight singles in this game. And that's frustrating because you had all those singles in that inning and the walk, and you only get three runs. That's very frustrating because they had Daniel Lynch on the ropes right there and didn't really knock him out. I, It was good to see they had a game plan versus him because the other two starts versus the White Sox, he's been filthy. So they have a better game plan, but the execution when the runners are in scoring position was lacking. All but besides like Elvis Andres, who drove in three of the runs, it was a tough day as far as getting extra base hits. The White Sox, this is a theme, singles, singles, singles. They lead the league in singles. I think they're clear, like at least 10 singles of the next, the second place team, because that's what they do. And you can blame Frank Minichino if you want, but it's the players. After a while, you got to look at and say, hey, man, you got to deliver. And so many singles today because the balls were on the ground forever. And that's why they hit into like three ground out into double plays too. So they have a problem with ground balls. Those singles that we're talking about, they were seeing eye singles through the infield for the most part. They were hit nicely, but they weren't hit in the air. The White Sox need to have a better approach at the plate where they're getting balls into the air, hitting more line drives. I mean, hell, you saw that 118 off of uh, Luis Roberts' bat. Yes, it got caught, but I would have many more of those than the singles the White Sox have been having in uh, for the most part, because that's as they expect a batting average of 770, and those singles probably are in the 300s, if that. 
That would have been a single too, though, Herb. Even if that hadn't been <laughs> caught, that would have been a single too. And and I think that's the. I mean, that's the thing. You know, you you said it perfectly. I mean, listen, this might be this might be Frank Manichino's fault, and he might pay the price in the off season for it by losing his job. It's very possible that could happen. It happens in baseball all the time. But we've seen all these players hit the ball in the air. We've seen all these players hit home runs. They didn't forget how to do it, right? They're just not doing it. I mean, I, it, it is. It is. I mean, certainly at this point, blame goes everywhere. You can't you can't say anything but that. But it, it's it's shocking. It still remains shocking to me that these guys have seemingly just stopped, completely changed direction on what they were doing. Uh, maybe you know, maybe they did forget how to do it. Who knows? Maybe they all walked into the clubhouse one day, and Will Smith standing there with the red memory eraser thing from Men in Black, and everybody just thought, oh, they're. What's all? What's a home run? I don't know. We have no idea what a home run is. Um, you know what? I saw the stat today. They've hit one home run in their last seven games or something mm -hmm. like that. And it was when they were losing by ten. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's it's silly. It's silly at this point that they can't do it because we know who all these players are and we know that they can do it. Right. It, it's just absurd uh, and truly. I mean, I don't think the White Sox hit a ball out to the warning track today. It, it was very weird. And Jason mentioned uh, the White Sox scoring over five just hasn't happened. Uh, I think the, the last time they scored over five was against Detroit um, on that Sunday game or the Saturday game. And then before that, it was the Texas series. That was the last time we did a remote show. They scored eight runs, guys. And that was weeks ago. I mean, what, what is going on? August Abreu is supposed to be here hitting home runs. He's not doing that. He's been fantastic. He's getting on base he's hitting singles everybody's hitting singles the White Sox were the only game the Royals and White Sox were the only game that played today so I can say Herb that your intuition about the White Sox leading Major League Baseball in singles is absolutely correct they lead by 27 singles Oof. 777 singles that's a wild baby that's a slot machine right there come on why they have no <laughs> luck though they have no luck nothing's ha nothing's had no they're not winning <laughs> they consistently lose what's happening uh yeah, just like a slot machine. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey there you go uh if you have a gambling problem call 100 gambler uh <laughs> the white Sox lead uh mlb in singles by 27 750 is the second place team colorado rockies they're not good i mean like it's it's Truly they also should have more home runs. They should. The Rockies, yeah. <laughs> but, but even when the White Sox went to Colorado, they couldn't hit home runs. Who hit a home run in Colorado? Nobody. Where are the home runs? It's getting ridiculous. Um, anyways, uh, it's just ridiculous to seeing this White Sox team play Royal Baseball. The White Sox are losing consistently to the Royals because they are trying to out-single, play good defense, and run the bases well against the Royals. They can't do that. They can't run the bases well. They can't play defense well. They only hit singles. Like, the only way they beat the, the, the Royals, the only way they win the AL Central is through power. This is the worst-case scenario for the 2022 White Sox. In a game like this, where Michael Kopech is unable to pitch, he looks uncomfortable. Like Herb says, his first pitch is 88 miles per hour. He doesn't really get it up to normal Michael Kopech velocity until his fourth pitch at 92.3. Um, you know, it, it is really just concerning that the White Sox can't pick up their offense against a team that is this below 500. This Royals team is bad. They don't have a lot of power outside of Salvi and Vinny Pascatino, but he ended up leaving the game after, after his second at bat. Um, so it is frustrating. It, it, it's it's ridiculous. And the one time they get an extra base hit in this game, I think AJ Pollock uh, got a single. Shocker! He hit I think their seventh straight single. And then the bad luck, Luis Robert smokes another ball out to the right field gap, and it just gets over the fence, hits for a ground rule double. AJ Pollock has to stay at third base, and the White Sox are unable to drive that run home. They had two runners right there, seventh inning. Could have made that game, I think, tied at that point, or they, they could have taken the lead at that point, um, and, and they just weren't able to. And it's just by a matter of inches right there. If that one stays in, you know, Luis Robert has a, an easy double, and, and the White Sox have the lead. And that's a bad break. I mean, that, you know, that, right. that yeah. happens, whatever. But there were a lot more scoring opportunities, including times where they did score runs in which they could have had, or a run in which they could have had a lot more. Um, you know, I think after they tied the game at four, they still had two runners in scoring position with one out. I mean, you know, get the guy home from third base. Like it, it's, it's, it's the same old story, right? I mean, it's the same thing we, we talk about all the time. They've got these chances. They can't cash it in. This is a good, this is a team that can hit. We have to stop saying that they can't hit because they can hit, they cannot score. And that's been a season long issue. It is, it was an issue today. And it really seems like it's going to be an issue moving forward because 
we, we you can go back how many days and look at all the run totals and it's two, three, two, three, one, zero, two, three. I mean, it's 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 consistent at this point. They consistently cannot score, which is so odd because they can consistently hit. I mean, here's the thing. If you're going to hit nothing but singles, you're still getting hits. I mean, like you're still you still should you should be scoring more runs than that with all of those singles. Right. I mean, I get I totally get it. Extra base hits are going to get you more runs. What a surprise. Uh, and that's a problem. But they they have this, they have a problem scoring runs, getting people home. You know, they, they single when people are they single when people are not on base and then they can't single when guys are on base. It's uh, it's it continues to just be absolutely confounding. Right. They, they just I mean, they're good at one thing. They're good at making contact that gets to the outfield. If I told you right now, the White Sox and Dodgers have the same batting average. People might get, you know, really like, oh, wow, the Dodgers are a really good team. The, the, the White Sox, 259 batting average. The Dodgers, 361. The place it falls apart, getting on base, a 336 batting average team uh, on base percentage, sorry, uh, for the Dodgers, and a 452 slugging percentage for the Dodgers. The White Sox, 313 and 385. Weighted runs created plus Ooh. for the Dodgers, 121. The team weighted runs created plus for the White Sox, 100. They're an average hitting team. And the reason they've been winning games is pitching. And here we are looking at Michael Kopech leaving the game, looking uncomfortable, throwing 19 unlike, un Michael Kopech like pitches. This is probably one of the most concerning points of the White Sox season, I, I, I think, just because that rotation that has kept you in this division for so long could possibly be getting weaker. I mean, Michael Kopech, this is the most innings he's thrown in his career. And if the White Sox are going to keep doing this, they're going to keep losing. I just think that I find solace and I've relaxed myself to know that after that four nothing first inning, Herbie Sunshine, Herbie Sunshine, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> I got I got to give a little a little dab that they came back. You know, I was like, okay, Daniel Lynch is on the bump. They haven't seen him all long, and the first three innings were proving me right until we get the Josh Harrison hit in the third. I was like, okay, here we go. We've broken through, and then the fourth inning comes where they get the three runs on the five hits and the one walk. While not what they should do, as Vinny says, you have enough singles to score a little bit more runs. If you have that many singles in an inning, you should be scoring at least four or five runs. But the White Sox are a station-to-station -station team where they have very little team speed to get those extra bases. They don't take the first to third as much as the other teams. So it's good that they didn't give up, scored those three runs, and then you get the uh, RBI double by Elvis Andres later in the game to tie the game. But then Elvis at second. I believe there's only one out at that time, and they don't score him. So the execution at times is failing, but they do have the heart and will to compete versus this team. Now, pushing it over the top versus the Royals is probably easier said than done for them because they're 7-9 and nine on the season. But I didn't see anything in that Royals bullpen that should have shut the White Sox down for the rest of the game. So that's the, that's the frustrating part where you get to the level – back of 4-4, four, four, and then you just die. And most people hang the loss on to Joe Kelly because of his terrible, terrible eighth inning. But it's a team game. He did struggle, but you also have to come through as you're at the White Sox. I think they hit into three or four ground ball double plays. Those were a product of the White Sox being fooled on pitches, pulling pitches that should have been hit to the right field. Aloy Jimenez, a couple times he did that. One time led to a ground ball double play. The other time just led to a regular fly ball. So I need more, uh, better execution when people are on runners and scoring position. We see it from Yohan, but from most of the other guys, it's failing this year. Yeah. And, and I mean, even Ken Hines now turning on Pollock. I, I mean, this is something that, you know, this this team is really, they're either here one week or uh, here not here the other week. I mean, last week, if you asked fans, like, what do you think of A.J. Pollock as a leadoff hitter? They're like, oh, he's hitting over 400. Now we got Ken in here saying, stop leading off Pollock. It's like, no one's hitting. I mean, if you bat, the, you know, Pollock, one, four, seven, eight, nine, he's going to do the same thing. The batting order doesn't matter, guys. I mean, I, I think that there's clearly, after how many games, 120 plus games, there's clearly something just wrong with this team. And I, I think I agree with Jesus in, in the, the comments here. I got to be honest. I think Cleveland's in a much better shape than the Sox going forward uh, next season. I can't imagine the guardians being the favorite uh, unless the Sox make big changes because again, like we keep playing more games. It's not early on in the season anymore where we've, this has been the issue for the white Sox since they've been playing Cleveland in, in, in April. They're, they're not taking walks. They're not hitting the ball hard. Um, and it's just, you know, more frustration and more frustration. And they're not taking care of business seven and nine uh, versus Kansas city. 
this year. That's just not going to do it. And they had, you know, Kansas City, you know, close, even though Michael Kopech left the game, even though they weren't able to capitalize uh, in certain moments, like you said, uh, that game was still tied up. Going into the eight, uh, the seventh inning, bottom of the seventh inning, uh, Elvis Andres ended up doubling, like you mentioned. Harrison and Zavala struck struck out to end that threat. Um, and then Graveman came in. Uh, it was a very kind of fun matchup, seeing Bobby Witt get on um, and then having him try to steal, not steal, not steal. And Stoney's like, he's going to steal. He's going to have that bag no matter what. And then he had that bag. Um, you just kind of see that unfold. That was a fun back and forth, but the Royals weren't able to get Witt in, uh, who got to third on a wild pitch. Uh, but yeah, the, the eighth inning right here gets real bad for Joe Kelly. He starts off by hitting Michael Massey, that hitting uh, Michael D minus Taylor, then real Ryan scary. O'Hearn. Real scary, too. I mean, no, <laughs> yeah. thank God Taylor yeah, turned seriously. his shoulder because that would have hit him right in the face. That would have been bad. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, and even Andrew, too. Uh, Andrew's got some some from, yeah, yeah, to cut on his lip. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and going upstairs is always a uh, uh, scary. So, thankfully, Mike Taylor uh, was all right. Uh, Ryan O'Hearn then single to left field. Uh, then Nicky Lopez ended up grounding uh, to uh, Elvis Andrews, throw, throw to home, force out at home. Uh, so, the White Sox get one out. Base is still loaded, though. And then rookie Drew Waters comes up in his first major league game, 0 for 3, and Joe Kelly walks in the game-winning run on five pitches herb i understand your point that joe kelly doesn't lose the game here um there's obviously other mistakes that joe kelly makes here but you look in the moment and this is why i think tony ends up pulling him is you are the veteran in this moment you're the one making seven million dollars you were brought here to be the shutdown guy drew waters has never been in this position before Mm -hmm. you are supposed to have the composure you are supposed to have the the wit and know how to get out of it and i understand joe kelly was squeezed on one of those uh ball three was a strike he got screwed by the umpire but that happens in baseball you shouldn't be in a 2-0 count anyways versus drew waters you got to get a first pitch strike on that with the bases loaded you have to see better execution there so it is frustrating to see joe kelly in a moment like that where a double play is available at every single base you need a ground ball He's not able to throw a strike that that's extremely frustrating for a guy that the White Sox went out and paid big money to. Well, and it's Joe Kelly, right? Right. I mean, Joe Kelly's reputation is that he is the aggressor. He is the guy that's going to go after these guys and and get them. I mean, he's a guy who, uh, you know, everybody remembers what he did against the Astros, but he's been on the mountain one, two world series. This is a guy who, uh, you know, they got to be that veteran presence to, to be somebody that could take care of these big moments. Right. I mean, listen, I understand it's Kansas city in August, but the game's on the line, right. you know, and, and this is what Joe Kelly wants. When he, when he talked to us in spring training and said, Hey, it's all about what you do in October. It's, you know, October is the biggest stage. That's what you got to do. Uh, you know, I'm sure he wasn't thinking about uh, playing the sub 500 Royals, but this is the game on the line. If you can handle winning the world series, you can handle <laughs> beating the Royals in August. And so that it, it was, it was, he was all over the place. He hit two guys. He's walking another one with the bases loaded. This is not, this is not what the White Sox were hoping for when they got him. I don't think it's what Joe Kelly was hoping for. Certainly. Um, it, 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 these are, it, it's these kind of moments like this, that, that could end up being a big deal. Not because, you know, not because any game in August is worth more than anything else, but just because you could have won it. You had, you know, I don't want to say you had it cause they never had the lead, but you could have won this game. If Joe Kelly does his job, he didn't, uh, and I'm sure he's really pissed about it. Uh, and, of course, as you mentioned, though, a lot of other guys could have done their job in this one, too, to make the outcome a little bit different. And Joe Kelly, I would – I mean, I know it's flippant and it sounds as well, as such. I would rather him give up Grand Slam in that situation than right. the bases loaded walk. I mean, I know it's more runs, but it's at least challenging the guy. It's at least challenging the guy inside the zone where he's, like, nibbling all around the zone. And I know that he didn't have premium – control a command enough uh at the beginning of the inning where he's hitting two batters to start off the inning but he looked like he regained it and drew waters as sean said 0 for 3 on the day making his major league debut here in kansas city throw it down the middle say drew hey man enjoy your first game if it's gonna be it's gonna be hit that home run or ground it to my guy at short and i'll uh, run you into a 6-4-3 so we can get the out the out of the inning but to throw that ball low and it was low it the the ball four was low on waters he failed right there he failed big time for the white Sox, and then had to been cleaned up by uh, jose ruiz who did a good job in his relief of joe kelly and as sean said the relief core for only giving up two runs in all those innings kudos to them but joe kelly today got cl 
Well, and also, I mean, the situation, MJ Melendez is up next. He ends up hitting a sacrifice fly. That's the sixth run for the Royals. But you just look at the situation. Drew Waters making his MLB debut. Yes, this is a guy that is a second round pick. He's clearly highly regarded. The Braves didn't want him, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have a bright future. He's only 23 years old. But behind him is MJ Melendez, who already has 14 homers this year in the big leagues, has 40 last year uh, between triple a and double a like the clear threat is at the plate pitch to the threat at the plate and the white Sox don't do that and and steven i want to go to the the quote you have from uh daryl uh where tony larusa ends up saying frustrating loss we came back from four nothing if you want to say we're lousy say we're lousy they're lousy I, I mean we don't need to really go too much into that i mean right now in an al central where clear, clearly this is a very weak division you are not even in first place two and a half games back and all the points, uh, the points bet sports books have you uh, as the favorite to win the division. You are clearly the most talented team in this division and it has not sunk, uh, you know, sync together yet. They don't have this synergy. They don't have everything working at the same time and you get a five game winning streak. And what do you agree to with, uh, you know, two losses against Houston, you get losses in, in Cleveland, uh, you know, split that one. And then you, you get another loss in KC. Uh, it's just frustrating, you know, one and four in their last five. It, it's just one way to greet your fans for the five game win streak. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, let's bring you back down to earth, back to 500 where this White Sox team belongs because they're lousy. Couldn't I mean, I read that. I, I read that. I read that quote. And I, I think, you know, having talked to Tony enough, I think I know kind of what he means by it. And I think he's more so pointing out that because he does this kind of thing all the time, you know, where he's saying, well, how could we have screwed up if we did something good kind of, you know what I mean? Kind of thing. And so I think that's what it was kind of like, you know, well, you can say what you can say, whatever you want, but there's no way I believe that we came back from down for nothing. And it's like, okay, it's a moral victory. Well, I mean, I think he's talking about just the, the general, the general team in a vacuum kind of situation, but you know, you got all these losses. (laughs) Right. I mean, like, that's, I mean, that's what that's the, everybody always says, right? You are what your record. You are what your record says you are. And, you know, there's there's a little over a month left here in the season and they can show that that's that's not true. But so far to this point, it's been very true. And I think the thing is not so much that they're lousy. It's that they're mediocre. Right. What's I mean, the that's, difference. Well, lousy means bad. Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm just saying, average. obviously, it's all relative to to expectations yeah they're way lousier than we thought they were going to be but i think the point being that like the thing that's frustrating i mean it would be the other way too but like they're not they're not as bad as the royals from a record standpoint but they but, are going the same place as them if they can't get two and a half games better than the guardians right now right I, yeah and i get your point and i get i get tony's point but the, the still the fact that you know they're down 4-0 we said it they, they played with fight i mean you know it's not like they gave up they were down four nothing they tied this game up But when we talk about throat stopping time for this team, the team that has two years of playoff experience, back to back years, trying to take that step up, you know, I thought throat stopping time was against the Astros when when you're, you know, having Yohan Moncada come up in the clutch in the eighth inning and you have those two wins. I thought that was throat stopping time. Like, let's close out this big victory for us. I didn't think it was going to be Kansas City in August. Like that, that, that is the, the part that's really, really frustrating. And I think that's the part that makes them lousy. Like their record would say mediocre, right? You know, close to 500, if not 500, most of the time they've been, you know, that, that level 62 and 60 isn't, isn't, you know, shining uh, a shining record here, but I'd say lousy just because of the competition that they're playing. I mean, really the team that they've been able to handle this year is a horrible, horrible Detroit team. That is the worst in baseball outside of that. They're they're pretty mediocre. So yeah, I, I, it's I, I get the point that maybe they're not lousy but mediocre. But uh, with fans' expectations, it's just absolutely frustrating. Absolutely, and I will say I did see the the comment saying I'm twisting myself into a pretzel to defend Tony. I, first of all, you mentioned a pretzel, and I'm I'm Sounds all about great. that. Keep associating my name with pretzels <laughs> because I just want as many ballpark pretzels as I can eat. But um, yeah, I, again, and I'm not I'm I don't know if I've tried if if it comes off as defense, so be it. I think what I want to do is give some context because a lot of people feel a certain way about the guy and various guys in this organization. And uh, I think that it's important to actually understand what they're saying rather than just be like, I don't like that guy. So I'm going to come up with a thing that reason for him saying what he's saying that reflects that dislike. And again, fan however you want. I'm just trying to add a little more to it. That's right. It. But I, I think if you go back to your comments at, at game 22, when Herb and I are freaking out, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think it's completely different than what you're saying right now. You're saying they're not executing. 
<laughs> I mean, you're, you're obviously not. Saying, not. You're <laughs> not mincing words. Like, yeah, right. I mean, you're not. You're not mincing words. I, I, I don't think that you're, 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 you're making yourself into a delicious Bavarian treat. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think, you're like a, you're, 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 you're cheese guy or you're a mustard guy. Cheese over mustard. I'm not right. anti mustard, um, but usually I just go plain. I'm a salt guy more than anything, I guess. But yeah, because the cheese at the ballpark, it's not like good cheese. You know what I mean? It's a petroleum product dressed yeah. up to look like cheese. And uh, so, you know, you can only have so much of that. But uh, mm, Petroleum. <laughs> but yeah, so if you get a good cheese, like a qual- quality cheese, then I'm all about it. Absolutely. Herbie Sunshine? Uh, anything. I probably prefer the mustard over the cheese. As Vinny said, cheese is kind of congealed and just reheated up. So, you know, after a while, that gets a little hard and stale. Mustard always works, and it wakes up the uh, nostrils, too. Right. If you get the good stuff, uh, you know, it really uh, – oh, the horseradish mustard. Mm. I just put that on a roast beef sandwich today. Very, very delicious. Uh, anyways, the White Sox lose 6-4. to four. Uh, Joe Kelly can't do his job. The White Sox uh, can't drive in those runs, those all-important runs, uh, and the White Sox fall to 62-60. and 60. We'll get into a little bit more of Michael Kopech conversation, and there's also a very, very fun project that the White Sox are putting together. So if you don't want to talk about the major league product, uh, well, we could talk about the minor league product. But what I got to tell you about Points Bet Sportsbook, it is counting down the days until – football season with a new offer every day until the season kicks off from now until September 8th, the points bet power hour will unlock a new daily offer from 12 to 1 PM central time. Sign up for sports uh, the points bet sports book now using the code CHGO to also get two risk free bets up to $2,000. But here's the real deal, right? I think you should take advantage of the points bet uh, power hour from 12 to 1 PM. You get free bets, boosted odds, and so much more. I've made a, a lot of money just taking advantage of this offer. It's been very fun to do. Uh, I got a free soccer bet today and I won $18. That was really great. But if you don't have money in a points bet account yet, if you haven't signed up, here is the offer for you. Sox fans, we still got almost two months left. The playoffs are right there for the taking and the White Sox still have a chance to win it all. And so do you. We had a live watch along this Sunday, but we are now extending this offer to today and tomorrow. When you're watching the Orioles and White Sox game tomorrow, make a 51 or more dollar deposit in a points bet account using the code CHGO and you get $2,000 in free risk-free bets, a yearly CHGO membership, a size C sock shirt, an exclusive CHGO sock script shirt, only available without this offer and a pair of slides from a CHGO locker. This is the best deal in town and it just got even better. So again, $2,000 in risk-free bets, a yearly CHGO membership, a size C sock shirt, an exclusive socks script shirt, only available with this offer and a pair of slides from a CHGO locker. And all you need to do is sign up with the PointsBet Sportsbook app using the code CHGO. If you have any questions, you can email pointsbet at allchgo.com and we'll help you out. And again, if you have a gambling problem or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-GAMBLING for crisis counseling and referral services. And our next partner has the greatest product I think Herb and I like to start our days with, uh, Athletic Greens. Our next partner has a product I use every day, Herb uses every day. He puts it in his smoothies. I put it in my water. I started taking AG1s because they supported CHGO out of the gate. They sent us the free trials, and I've been supporting them ever since because I wake up, have this delicious, mild, tropical uh, tasting drink that I have, and it fills me with 75 high quality vitamins, mineral, minerals, whole foods, so superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. And it helps me start my day right. My gut health has been better. My nervous system has feel you know less nervous. Uh, my immune system has been better. I've been less sick, and I feel you know the ability to focus and recover more. Uh, Those long days, those long watch along days really don't affect me as much when I am incorporating AG1 into my diet and my daily routine. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. And Athletic Greens has over 7,002 five-star reviews. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for millions of different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash CHGO socks. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash CHGO XOX to take ownership over your health, pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, let's go to Michael Kopech. And hey, Eric's asking what happened to my hair. Uh, Herb, what happened to my hair? You made a bet that the White Sox would be in first place by August 12th, where the White Sox have not met that accomplishment so you had to get your head shaved and we shaved it yesterday on our live watch along which never happened because the white <laughs> Sox and guardians game got postponed after like three hours of waiting 
And then I went to great clips like many suggested. And I asked the lady who, you know, trimmed me up, gave me a rounded edge at the bottom of my neck, cleaned up behind my ears, you know, finished off the Herbie Sunshine job. I said, how did my friend do on a, on a scale of one to 10? Uh, Vinny and Herb, you guys want to take your guesses on how Herb did on a scale of one to 10 on shaving my head with a razor, a, a male facial razor. What I'm guessing what the woman said or what I thought the job was. What the well, uh, you can give both. What would you think of the job? And then what, think, what, what would you give? What do you I, think the lady said? I think she went easy on Herb. So I think okay. she's, I think it's probably up seven or eight. That would be my guess. I would probably have been a little more critical. I probably would have gone with <laughs> about a four or a five. She probably said a two. And I think I did like a four with the tools I had. Um, your hair is not easy to shave either. No, so, no. So, yeah, I think I did like a four. Not a great job, but also in a pinch with the Manscaped Clippers. Man, <laughs> mercy. Hey, Vinny was right. She wasn't that hard on you. You got a 10 out of 10. So, a 10 uh, out of 10. Congratulations, wow. Herbie Sunshine. Now, I'll go work at Bowrix now. Where was it? Bowrix? Sport what? Clips? What? Oh, sports what? clips. Okay. I said great clips. Bowrix? Oh, you, you don't know what Bowrix is? No, what the fuck is Bowrix? It was one of these. Franchise uh, hair cutteries back in the day. Bo, mm. bo, bo, Ricks. No, no. Wow. You I'm, sorry. I'm really sorry. I was at Great I, Clips today as well, Sean. Huh, we were, it looks we both, great. Look at you. We both went to Great Clips today. Looks very nice. That this is our great. ad read for Great Clips. Right? Yeah, well, a well, a well run establishment. Yes. Uh, it was very funny. The lady who was cutting my hair, uh, her boss, like walked in on a Sunday, like an hour before they closed, and she's like looking around, like, "What the fuck is she doing here?" <laughs> like, while well, she's cutting my hair, and I'm like, "Oh boy, I better get out of here before this gets exciting." Anyways, uh, let's go into Michael Kopech. Herb, I'm gonna need some sunshine here because Raul Green saying it. Michael Kopech needs to be shut down. Uh, you know, looking at it. You're right. They cut back coming from the bottom of the uh, the top of the first commercials. They come back and you see Michael Kopech bent over in pain before they can even flash the Chiron showing, hey, here's Michael Kopech's season stats. They already have a mound meeting with Ethan Katz coming out there and seeing if he's all right. You said it earlier. You would have pulled him before he threw 19 pitches. Why would you have pulled him? And and really, you know, what damage do you think they could have done in those 19 pitches? And I think Stoney uh, said it best. You got to protect these players from themselves. Michael Kopech's not going to say, I want to come out. He knew he tweaked something. Sebi saw him tweak something and knew that, hey, this is probably not best for him and his future and our team right now who are going through a playoff uh, push for the playoffs. So, yeah, I would have pulled him because seeing anything wrong with his legs specifically and i know it's the other knee or the other hamstring than the one that hurt before but you have precedent with this guy this year that he had to leave a game so i would have been extra cautious because michael kopech is the white Sox future along with dylan sees and this rotation moving forward it would have been great if he could have started the game and dud michael kopech things but you saw that that was the time to pull the plug on him and whoever would have replaced them, if it would have been Jimmy Lambert or any of those other pitchers, would have had as many pitches they need to to get ready for this game. So that's what I would have did. I don't think it's time to rest him. Hopefully this is a minor injury. Vinny said that they sent out a thing that it may be a hamstring or something like that. That's you know not anything great, but it's also probably won't get him shelved for the rest of the year. So. I just want the guy to come back healthy because he can help this team win a lot of games. You're right that he's not too concerned about it. We do have quotes from Michael Kopech coming from Daryl Van Scow and Vinny. We'll get your reaction after this because uh, they said left knee soreness. Uh, what was the White Sox official word after he was taken out? Uh, but Tony La Russa ended up saying that uh, it was a hamstring issue, not a knee issue as the team announced. But now Michael Kopech is saying the soreness is behind his left knee. Isn't sure exactly what the issue is yet. Quote, I don't really know how to describe it. Discomfort. We're going to continue to look into it. Quote, what sucks the most about today is I put the team in a tough situation. Second time this year I had to do that. And second time the bullpen had to carry the workload for us. It just sucks, especially knowing the position we're in, trying to make a push. And he continues by finishing up and saying, hopefully this won't keep me down too long. I don't think it will. So we're again, we're not really sure what it is. Tony Lewis is his hamstring. Michael Kopech says the pain is coming from behind his knee. And, you know, you go one inch above behind your knee and it's the hamstring. So, uh, you know, there it's all connected back there. guys. Welcome it's, to the CHGO doctor's office. This is anatomy 101. <laughs> uh, yeah. Next time we're going to be taking out his wrenched ankle and the butterflies in his stomach too. next. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
listen, it's uh, it's it's obviously not good. We discussed it at the top of the show. Like, this is not what you want. The thing is that it comes with a guy who's being treated in a specific way because of his very specific situation, right? This is a guy who has a major injury, missed two full years. Um, he doesn't have that innings base to be able to make him a reliable starting pitcher going forward, or at least if he, whether he is one of those now or not, they want to make sure that he is moving forward. Um, we've heard since months before this season started that Michael Kopech in 2022 was going to be just a, as much about Michael Kopech in 2023 as it was about Michael Kopech in 2022, right? It was about developing, con continuing to develop, making sure you were healthy enough, um, taking that ball every fifth day. And that's why they've gone with this kind of creative approach in that they're not they didn't circle a number and say, we're shutting him down here. You know, I mean, it, it, they didn't do the Steven Strasburg thing because they wanted him to be able to pitch in these high leverage moments like he might have been pitching in today had, had that game gone differently and had his uh, his day gone much differently. Um, it didn't work out that way. And now you've got to wonder, you know, if it's if if it's an injury that would add complications to that plan, that very specific plan that they have set out for him. So they're 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 managing him moment to moment, game to game. Uh, and obviously right now there's a big wrench, no pun intended from my earlier operation joke, thrown into the works there uh, with what they're going to be able to do moving forward. Now, if Michael is correct and it's not something that to be super concerned about, then great. But uh, he had that thing earlier in the year, as you guys mentioned, on the other leg, um, that, that, that was an issue and maybe slowed him down a bit. And uh, now late August into September is not the time that you want to be slowed down. Right. And, you know, you look at what he happened after those last couple of games and the velocity was just affected and he just wasn't the sharpest player. And it really felt like he started coming into his own again in mid July. But in those five starts after 26 and one third innings and he had an ERA of 615. So now if the White Sox are looking at Michael Kopech even pushing through this injury, you're not going to get the same 347 ERA or whatever pitcher that you've been getting this entire year. Because the main thing that we've seen with Michael Kopech is they're still trying to figure out the right shape for that slider. They're still trying to figure out the right depth to that curveball. They haven't really been able to figure out how his breaking stuff works as a starter. But what has carried him is this fastball, this magical fastball that hitters just cannot solve. You look at the Yankees when they were really clicking, they had no answer for Michael Kopech's fastball and what he was able to throw up there. And recently, I mean, we see against the Tigers, six innings, 11 Ks, three walks, mainly because that fastball was up at 95 miles per hour. If he has this knee discomfort, like he's saying, is that going to hurt that threshold of the effectiveness that he is? And now I just wonder, we see this with Garrett Crochet, the injury knocks him out for this year and they're trying to build him up to a starter. That looks like that is being delayed. Are the White Sox doing this starter routine the right way? He just threw a career high in the major leagues of 110 innings, uh, but his career high back in the minor leagues, I think was 134 and a, a third. Um, so yeah, 134 and a third. So, and that was 2018. So it's been a long, long time since Michael Kopech has been up at this type of workload. So I, I just worry that the plan that they have, that is kind of this wait and see and judge after every single game. It's concerning to me. I wish they had more of a plan and more of even like a, a pitch number because you see him throw 85 uh, pitches against Detroit in six innings where he has no hit ball. And then I was surprised in the last outing that he just went out against um, that they pushed him another inning. Uh, he ended up going up against the uh, Houston team, uh, the Houston Astros. And I think he was around 78 pitches. I was surprised they ended up push it, pushing him um, to that next inning. Actually, I think he only got five pitches in that final inning. So I think he was at 85 pitches after five innings in that Houston game. I thought that was going to be a perfect time to pull him. They end up getting lucky. He only throws five pitches in the next inning. He gets out with 90, but I, I just would have liked more of a plan, more of a baseline for Michael Kopech because he is such an important player for this White Sox future. And we've talked about it when he's clicking him and Dylan Cease look like two aces for you know the next five years. I mean, it really doesn't seem like there's anything stopping these guys except injury. And, and here we are looking at right now, Herb. And the injury while bad as a hamstring, whatever back of the knee injury, it's not an arm injury. If they allowed him to keep on pitching through that, it could develop into an arm injury, but it looked like his velocity was down because his plant leg, which he said the left leg was the one that was giving him the trouble, probably couldn't push off enough and get enough uh, torque on his uh, pitches. So the miles per hour initially down, and then he got him up to about 93 a couple times. But So the arm is still good. If you have any type of positivity out of this, arm looks fresh. The arm looks like it's going to be all right. 
And hopefully this thing is just a, okay, we had one hiccup just like last uh, time he had an injury off the mound and he had to leave early, and he only misses this start, and he's posting up next five for the fifth day. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I think that the plan that they came up with, which obviously is a fluidish one, you know what I mean? It's not a, it's not like you said, Herb, it's not, or like you said, Sean, it's not circling a number and saying that's the stop sign right there. Um, I think that's okay because it allows him to learn how to pitch, right? I mean, I think, you know, you're not, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be, in 2023 or 2024 and Michael Kopech pitching in high leverage games. And all of a sudden it's like, well, I know how to go to 85 pitches. I don't, I don't really know how to keep going past that. Uh, again, that might be a little hyperbolic, but still it, it, it just seems that this allowed them to have the best of both worlds in a way. And I think the way the season has ended up going probably is coloring the idea that only one of those worlds matters. You know what I mean? Back in, Back in November, when Rick first said it to us, or even back in March, before the season started, uh, you know, you wanted Michael Kopech to be able to pitch in September and in October. And I think, you know, it's probably results based now that you know I, why why is he out why is he out there now? They're only five hundred, blah blah blah, you know, kind of thing. So, but I think I remember you know thinking about the Sox, you know, talking at the trade deadline that you know them adding a starter might be you know something they should look into just because of this Kopech injury or issue. I thought that you know, they might move him to the bullpen at some point just because he was about to hit that 100 uh, inning uh, mark. So I, I thought that maybe more of a plan or less starts from Michael Kopech would have been smarter. And I think it is tough. You know, I mean, Herb mentions, you know, players want to play, p- pitchers want to pitch. Kopech is so hard on himself after a bad outing. And of course he's going to be hard on himself because his two idols in the White Sox clubhouse are Johnny Cueto, who's at 36 years old, throwing eight inning uh, performances back to back and Lance Lynn. Like those are the two guys in the clubhouse that he's looking up. And those two guys are workhorses. I bet he wants to be exactly like that. But the issue is Lance Lynn and Johnny Cueto have gone up and through the ups and downs of a major league career and have had seasoned arms and have pitched through postseasons before and know how to push their body. I don't think Michael Kopech knows how to do that. And I think this was at least a prime example of, you know, us seeing a player probably pushing themselves when they shouldn't have with the 19 pitches today, which again, you know, they, they, I, I thought they needed to make a bit better decision in this moment today. I think it's less about the the wide scale stuff. The wide scale stuff just becomes more concerning if he's not able to make another start, right? If he's not able to make another start or, or two starts or three starts, then we're seeing more Davis Martin and the White Sox are already having a, a struggling Lucas Giolito. Lance Lynn's been up and down and then you're adding a rookie into the mix and, and that just gets concerning. So uh, the White Sox are, you know, could get out of some trouble here if Michael Kopech's not injured, uh, but we will have to wait and see. Again, it was not too bad for the Yasmani Grandal news, uh, and hopefully it won't be too bad for Michael Kopech. We got to let you know about our good friends over at PointsBet. Since we had the postponed game and a game, to, uh, game today, we will be running the CHGO promo for the game today and tomorrow night versus the Orioles. So this is the deal. Sign up with the PointsBet app and make a deposit of $51 or more, either pregame or live tomorrow for the Orioles and White Sox game, and use the code CHGO when you make that deposit. You'll get $2,000 in risk-free bets, a yearly CHGO membership, a size C sock shirt, an exclusive CHGO sock script shirt, only available with this offer, and a pair of slides from the CHGO locker. So that is a great value for $51. You're getting $51 in points bet bets you're getting two thousand dollars in risk-free bets a yearly chgo membership a size sock seat shirt an exclusive chgo sock script shirt only with this offer and a pair of slides from the chgo locker all you need to do is sign up on the points bet app using the code chgo and make a dollar a, a deposit of 51 dollars or more again tomorrow for the orioles and white Sox game it's the best deal in town and it just got even better so take advantage while you can, you can see it on the screen right there. Uh, get the shirt, win or lose, new years on, new users only, and uh, the order will ship in four to six weeks. You get the size C shirt, the new CHGO script shirt, uh, the CHGO slides, $2,000 in risk-free bets, and you get the yearly CHGO membership. So it's a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic offer for our CHGO listeners. And if you or somebody you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-GAMBLER for crisis counseling and referral services. If you have a yearly CHGO membership, you'll be able to read Vinny uh, Duber's new article about Project Birmingham. Uh, and if you are a CHGO member, go check it out. It's a great 13-minute read. 
very in-depth, but you got the chance to speak with Chris Getz. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about Project Birmingham? Yeah, so the idea, obviously, I'm sure a lot of folks saw earlier today. That's a, a lot of a lot of prospects were promoted to Double A Birmingham. Uh, a very weird and unusual uh, site, I'm sure. But uh, this is all part of kind of an experimental program that the Sox are are running, uh, which is basically put everybody that's a top prospect, you know, and if you saw the list, it goes way down the list. Uh, everybody that's a top prospect in this organization playing at Double A or below. And put them together for a month of the for the month of the season, the last month of the double A season. They're going to send all their top minor league coaching staff there. Obviously, you know they have a lot of uh, people that they employ and play on the player development side that are not part of those team coaching staffs as well. So all those folks are going down there, and it's going to be very daily, close, one on one instruction, individual stuff. They think it's really going to help with the development. And the model is really the alternate site. If you remember back to the pandemic shortened season in 2020, they had all those minor leaguers out at Schaumburg for the whole summer because there were there was no minor league season. And they saw a lot of benefits from that. They saw the coaches and the players get to work very closely over a long period of time. They do the same thing in instructional league, which you see in the off season every uh, year or after the end of the minor league season. But really, they kept he Chris kept citing this uh, the the alternate site plan that they had a few years ago because it was just so many of the top guys in the organization. And so they're going to try this in season, so you not only get what happened at the alternate site, you get to put them in games too, in the Southern league against, against real competition, real live game action. So put all that stuff that you're working on into effect. They're not expecting all these guys that they're calling up from high a and low a to tear up double a, uh, you know, in terms of numbers, they don't care what the numbers are. They just want that coaching. They want that. Uh, they want that instruction and they want that to go on in this kind of very unique environment. Chris wasn't sure of any, other teams that have done this in season. And so the White Sox may be really coming up with uh, with a new idea here, and we're, we're going to see uh, what kind of benefits it, it pays off. I would imagine there's going to have to be positives out of it, right? Because you are putting these young guys with the guys who are in charge of turning them into major league players. The more you can do that, the better. So there really doesn't seem to be much of a downside. Uh, a few things to point out, because I'm sure people are going to wonder. It uh, has nothing to do with – what position they think these guys should be at right now. Colson Montgomery didn't get promoted to Birmingham today because he was done at Winston-Salem. Now, maybe this goes well, and next year he starts at Birmingham and he doesn't have to go back there. Who knows? But uh, this isn't a traditional promotion for any of these guys. It is just a very experimental thing that they're going to see about doing. So it might not follow that linear, you know, you, you finish A ball, then you go up to – double A, then you go up to triple A. Uh, and who knows, maybe some guys could even get promoted to triple A over the course of the next month too. Uh, none of that is precluded, but uh, this is just kind of a unique situation. Not necessarily that look at all these guys who are ready to play double A ball for the Sox. Yeah. A lot of great info in that article. So definitely check it out. A lot of great stuff on Colson, a lot of great stuff on Oscar Colas as well. Um, but let's get into some of the stuff with project uh, project Birmingham. I was going to say project Montgomery project Birmingham. Uh, there are plenty of big names as far as white Sox prospects go. That will be a part of this. Uh, like Vinny mentioned, Colson Montgomery and Oscar Colas are the organization's two highest ranked minor leaguers, but also Brian Ramos, Norhe Vera, Jose Rodriguez, Sean Burke, Christi uh, Christian Mena, Yoki Cespedes, Jared Kelly, Wes Kapp, Matthew Thompson, Thompson, and Cole Simas will all be there in the newly expanded AA Clubhouse, too. That's 10 of the team's top 20 prospects under one roof. I also love the part about Jose Rodriguez in there. And when I was reading it, like I think the first line, I was like, oh, this sounds like what they did in 2020. And then you literally say, it's what they did in 2020. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. You also got a uh, firsthand a view of th that. So uh, we'll get Herb in. But uh, what was it like being at the actual 2020 site? Uh, and then Herb will get your reaction too. Certainly it was weird. You know what I mean? It was a bunch of minor league guys just practicing in an empty stadium all day, every day. Um, I, when I got to, when I, the day that I went there to watch uh, a scrimmage, you know, they played a scrimmage against each other, but there were only so many guys there specifically on the position player side, they couldn't field two full teams. So you had pitch, you had coaches going out and playing <laughs> in the right field sometimes or playing, uh, you know, on the infield if they needed to, just because there weren't 18 or, or 16 different position players there. Um, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of weird to see. And obviously nobody in the stadium and you're watching a scrimmage game at a, in a minor league stadium, but uh, they're doing all those, all the drills that you would expect. And, and certainly at these minor league facilities uh, that they have, you know, these um, 
affiliated minor league sites. That was the Schaumburg Boomers. That's an, an independent team. They don't have to really deal with having their um, – facilities up to up to the snuff so to speak of any one major league organization the white sox i'm sure dictate the exact facilities that there are at birmingham and so you send these guys there and they probably get an expanded thing it's not just pitchers go throw a bullpen uh you know down the left field line it could be probably a lot more things going on there uh in terms of batting practice in terms of pitching practice fielding as well so um that alternate site was a weird experience as everything was that year. Um, but, uh, you know, I did see Nick Madrigal rocket a home run off the scoreboard at Schaumburg, uh, something he, he uh, you know, you wouldn't expect from him. But, uh, I mean, you know, remember that Andrew Vaughn was there and that was really his, that was his full season of minor league baseball, right? Because he had only played in a handful of games, what, 50 games or something like that for Winston-Salem the year prior, uh, the year he was drafted. So, you know, Andrew Vaughn is a special case, obviously. Remember that when you keep uh, asking, when's Colas going to be up here? When's Montgomery going to be up here? Andrew Vaughn is the exception, not the rule. But they got enough of an eye on him there that they knew that he was ready to play Major League Baseball last year. And I don't think that, or and, you know, had that alternate site not existed in uh, the circumstances where the minor league season was canceled, uh, they might not have been able to to make that determination. And perhaps he would have started 2021 uh, in the minor league somewhere. So they saw a lot of benefits from having those eyes on those guys and their hands on those guys every single day that summer. And what I like about it is like the Jerry Reinsdorf owned teams, while they get poo-pooed on for different things, the one great thing the Jerry Reinsdorf owned teams do is loyalty. So – I want White Sox people to be doing more things like this outside the box stuff because you know you're going to have a job after doing things like this. It's outside the box. It's experimental and it's very refreshing being proactive instead of reactive to what the rest of the league does. Because if this goes off, this is what other teams will be doing all the time. And I love that the White Sox are trying this out with their top prospects for the most part. Colson Montgomery. Another stair step. You started in single A, low single A, then you went up to high A. Now he's going to double A, going to face some tougher pitches. Let's see what he can do in this short period of time. And with the instruction for more people at a higher level, maybe Colson Montgomery's um, progression and development goes from one step to another just by facing tougher pitches, goes back to the offseason and say, okay, I saw what they're throwing me. I saw what they're giving me in that next level. Next time, I'm going to go do this, that, and the other. And that w- that helps him out instead of seeing the single-A pitchers, which he's been dominating most of the year. So, yeah, I am a big-time fan of what Chris, Chris Getz, uh, Rick Hahn, and the folks at the White Sox minor league staff are doing right here. It's a different thing. And you know their uh, staff is, what, 28th organizational-wise or low in the top bottom 10 of organizations. So why not? Why not try to jumpstart your – organization and prove these people wrong who make these rankings and say we actually have great talent here and what we're going to do is have them all around each other and push each other to the next level and have our instructors be all in one central location so we can get the best out of them for this last month yeah and kind of going with that i thought we can end on this uh this quote from chris Getz, kind of you know speaking to what you're talking about herb uh you know rick Hahn obviously didn't make a move at the trade deadline and it felt like because the white Sox valued their prospects more than the uh rest of the mlb did and chris Getz said i view it as an opportunity to celebrate what we've done depart- departmentally with bringing these players there and going back to strides we feel we've made with some of these players and to show organization but also uh outside the organization the next wave of what is hopefully our major league talent here in Chicago. We've had some players recently enter the top 100 prospects list, and we feel like we've gotten some more that are just outside of it. It's a chance to show baseball and show the White Sox that we have another wave of players coming. So it's a chance to show baseball and show the White Sox that we've got another wave uh, of players coming. Uh, That I think is just, you know, Chris Getz kind of being like, hey, don't worry. We we didn't trade people for a reason. Jose Rodriguez, very interesting, very young. Oster Colas killing it down in double A. This Colson Montgomery kid we took in the first round should have been a top 10 pick don't worry nor hey Vera's throwing 100 uh it's it's frustrating not seeing their moves at the trade deadline or lack of moves at the trade deadline but hopefully they will be able to turn some of these guys into big major leaguers 
big uh, contributors to the major league team and the White Sox can continue to keep this uh, this window open. Uh, but again, frustrating day for the White Sox because they still lose six to four to the Royals. And that is what's most important is the health of the major league club. And if they are winning or not, we will see if they win tomorrow. They have a three game set that we will be covering here on CHGO against the Orioles all at 605 Central Time. Tuesday, August 23rd, Dylan Cease versus Austin Both. Uh, then on the 24th, 6.05, Lucas Giolito versus Spencer Watkins. And then on the 25th at 6.05, Lance Lynn versus Jordan Lyles. We will have pre-games and post-games shows for you then. All of us will be in studio, so it should be a fun time. No more head shaving, but maybe we'll dye uh, Herb's head blonde. And we'll talk more about Project Birmingham. Frosted more about tips. Frosted tips. Frosted tips. Uh, we'll talk more about Project Birmingham, more updates for Michael Kopech's injury, and more about the White Sox and see if they can struggle to win the AL Central or make it into the playoffs. A big matchup with the Birds from uh, Baltimore tomorrow. That's Vinny Duber. You can follow him on Twitter, at Vinny Duber. He's the CHGO White Sox beat writer. That's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter, at Ecknerwall23. He's the CHGO White Sox community leader. And I am Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter, at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to Stephen Nicholas for producing the show, and thank you to Fleetwood Mac for the 1979 album Tusk. Goodbye.